here we are now with another episode of the Andrew Lake Podcast. Today I'd like to talk about learning to walk. We've already done a series on learning to breathe. And I said at the end of that, as a little joke, that we could do a whole series just on learning to walk. (laughs) We're not going to do a whole series. I just thought I'd share a few thoughts today. A few illustrations surrounding walking and meditation and awareness techniques. And we've got some cultural references for you. But just like learning to breathe, there is as much in learning to walk as there is in any consciousness technique. It really is something that is so simple and yet runs so deep. I have met a man who, as a part of his meditation training, attended a certain monastery, which had a certain course, which was surrounding walking awareness. And I don't remember all the exact details of his course, But in essence, the structure was that he spent 26 days just focusing on walking. And it was a very elaborate, complicated process, which was laid out for him and those in the course. And it started with walking a certain distance, which was quite short, only 10 meters or something, at a certain pace for a certain amount of time. And gradually, over time, over the days, the distance changed, the pace changed, and the amount of time that you took for each step changed. And he said that he got to the point where it was 30 seconds for each step for the entirety of of the day. And he said, when that happens, it takes an hour and a half just to have your lunch. Just to go to where they're serving the lunch, to get your food, to go to your table, and then to sit down and eat and go back, it takes an hour and a half. Now, when this is happening, you don't want to forget your fork. (laughs) You wouldn't want to be the one that has to go back and you wouldn't want to be the one that trips over now in that that is the that is the key that is the insight that is the grind to awareness that forgetting the fork don't forget your fork think ahead really be absolutely clear about every single movement that you make And like a lot of hardcore consciousness retreats, it's very tedious. It's incremental and it's very tedious. It takes work. There's an effort there. But he said the effect was that you end up basically disappearing. And that movement of walking becomes more like floating and he was a pretty hardcore meditator he knew a lot about he'd done all sorts of courses all all around the world so that's at least one example of the extreme of using walking as an awareness technique but let's consider what happens when a baby learns to walk Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever seen that for yourself? Have you ever seen a baby's first steps? Now, in some cultures, there's a big fuss made over it. Whoa, their first steps, we've got to catch it on camera. 
But I find with the children and the bubs that I know in my life that learning to walk is more gradual for them. And there are clear points where you can say, yes, now the baby knows how to roll over, whereas before they didn't. And now not only the baby knows how to roll over, but they can crawl around, whereas before they didn't. And they can't walk, definitely can't walk, can't even stand up by themselves, but they can crawl. And then eventually, over time, you say, oh, learning to walk, still a bit shaky, still need to hold mummy's hand. And then there's a certain point where they can walk. And how gradual it is, how there's actually, there are milestones, but if we really look and watch how the child is learning, then you can see that it is gradual. And it's the same with consciousness techniques. It's the same with meditation. There are clear points. There are clear milestones which are as clear as the difference between crawling and walking. And yet between those two points, crawling and walking, there are gradations. There are incremental steps. And if you look at how many times a baby falls over, and babies do fall over, they always, sometimes forward, sometimes backwards, and you can sort of tell that there's even, even within that, there's a level of experience. Because a baby can fall over and hurt themselves quite hard. They hit their head on the floor. They don't know how to catch themselves. And some babies at certain points, they learn to bend. They bend in the waist and they fall on their bum instead of their head. And they have to learn that. And some babies at a certain point, they fall over and they do hit their head, but they think, oh, no problem. They just brush themselves off. They don't really cry. They don't go into the hysteria like an inexperienced baby does. So learning is not just the gaining of a skill, but it's also the skill of hurting yourself. Not only hurting yourself and dealing with it better, but also preventing it better. And also knowing that you've done it before and it's not really that much of an issue. And those qualities of learning, of learning to walk, are qualities that are in all forms of learning. For anything that you learn. Now, like learning to breathe, when we first go into this thing of learning to walk as a meditation technique, when you first do it, it's like changing things around and it's uncomfortable. We say, okay, Dosta, give me the meditation technique for walking meditation, and then you go try it, and when you try it, it's uncomfortable, it's unnatural. And there we have the immediate play around of this intention and this work and this difference between you doing something actively with your body rather than letting it happen. And if you want someone to change their walking, all you have to do is just say, make a comment about it. Oh, you walk like this. Oh, you walk like that. You look like this when you walk. Oh, are you walking like this? And that can make them, that moment of old self-conscious, their their walking changes. And a change in your walk should always be a trigger. And there's all sorts of things which can change the pace or the quality of your walk. Have you ever noticed? Can you think of those situations? Can you imagine walking through a certain place and it's the happiest day of your life and you're walking through and then you see a certain person and then your walk changes. Now, it might be that you're avoiding that person. It might be that you very much like that person. There are all sorts of reasons why that changes. But there is a change, 
And the trick is to notice when there is a change. And the trick to knowing when there is a change is to be conscious of your walk, to con be conscious of how you walk. Are you aware of that? Are you aware of the pace? Are you aware of how long your steps are, how hard you press, how much tension there is in your ankles and your feet, and how much variation there is in your walk throughout the day? One of these conversations we had was about physical exertion. And in that episode, we were talking about the variety of your day through physical movements and exhaustion. The same thing applies here. How many different paces of walk do you have throughout your day? And do you know that you can construct that so as to have a, a very intentional wide variety? And you can say, it, it can be as simple as, oh, it's before noon, I always walk a little bit faster. It's afternoon, I always walk a little bit slower. When the sun's rising, I walk fast. When the sun's setting, I slow down a bit. Just to help massage my body rhythms into the pace of the sun rising and falling. We can talk about being in sync with nature, being one with the world, being attuned to the cosmos, these sort of fluffy esoteric sayings. Well, here's a practical down-to-earth way to actually do that. And it's to learn to walk. And of course, when you start trying this, there's, there's a back and forth. You'll forget or you'll need to set a reminder. It needs to be a focus for some time. And there really are all sorts of kinds of walks. And they all say something. There's really... Like, think about, think about it this as a hypothesis. How someone walks says everything about them. Take that as a hypothesis. And it's not so much to go out and now you do people watching and cast judgment, oh, this guy's this or this girl's that. It's more to just look at it in yourself. And there are many examples. There are many different kinds of walks that I'm sure you can think of yourself. You know the difference between a walk and a strut. Can you notice when someone's strutting? You know how funny they look? When was the last time you saw someone strutting or you had a bit of a strut yourself? Have you seen this boxer, Conor McGregor? Have you seen him, what he does when he walks out onto the boxing ring for one of his matches? Now, I wouldn't have even known anything about this boxer because I don't walk, watch boxing at all. I wouldn't have known anything about him if he hadn't have done this kind of strut, this kind of walk. It's very funny. It's very, he's sort of like a peacock. He's got this, and he's flopping his arms around. I'm sure you've seen it. He's very famous. And that kind of str strut, well, <laughs> I guess he's a household name for it because of that. I, I mean, he's probably won lots of boxing as well. He's probably a great boxer. He probably has won. He's probably is good. I wouldn't know. I don't know anything about boxing. I don't care. But I just think it's so funny how he has that strut. And if you really want to pop someone's bubble, you point out their strut to them. <laughs> Because someone who's strutting usually doesn't know. They're very happy or pleased with themselves. But it's, it's usually a fake. It's usually pretty shallow. And you can easily bring them down by pointing it out to them. Now, in the case of the boxer, it's very funny when he struts out onto the ring like that. And he's waving his arms around and then he loses the match. I don't know if that's ever happened. Maybe he's won every fight. But I can imagine it would be really something when one person's got the strut and then the other boxer <laughs> delivers the goods. So that's something to be said about how the strut says something about you, but not necessarily what you think it means. There's also a certain walk 
that comes with it's different to the strut it's the macho testosterone i'm going to kill you the staunch walk maybe they're similar but i don't think so i think there is a difference there can you tell the difference between a staunch walk like i'm angry and the strut the hunched shoulders the clenched fists the stomping you know that's something else that's an emotional expression not a sense of self not an ego and there's also walking where you've got your tail between your legs have you heard this saying he or she came home with their tail between their legs now that's the expression of shame that's an expression of guilt they've done something very wrong something has happened that they're very very sad about almost like they've been punished or they've been told off and you can see this most easily in children because children do express themselves naturally they haven't had their emotional repressions put on them they haven't had their society constrict how they should express themselves just yet and when a child comes home with their tail between their legs the parents know what's up what's up with little doster what happened to little doster at school today he looks so sad his head's down and he's scuffing his feet a bit and he's walking a bit slower and feet scuffing is another one which can show an apathy scuffing feet is not a it's not exclusive to shame and guilt or being having the tail between the legs kind of walk but scuffing feet tells you something and the feet scuffing you can hear the sound if you're attuned to people's sounds and you're sensitive to sounds in the environment you can tell straight away and it really triggers something in me i think why are you scuffing and well i don't always i don't say that and i don't always think that but there is a certain laziness or a kind of i don't care attitude when someone's scuffing their feet and in certain situations at certain times with certain people it is appropriate to say stop scuffing your feet lift your heels up and you can populate that blueprint with all sorts of situations and now it might be also on the other side of it that the person is scuffing their feet for a reason and they do need care they are hurt like the child who's who's had some guilt or some shame put on them so there's no yes or no blueprint for any of these walks there's no there's no oh you're walking like this then that means this there's ne- there's never an interpretation like that for these it's always more complex than that it should always be oh you're walking like this this might mean a b c d e f g h i j k l m n o p let me inquire to find out and see or let's <laughs> maybe in the case of conor mcgregor it's let's turn off <laughs> and to the the sound of walk like even the sound if you hear one kind of walk that's very loud is a woman with high heels or a woman with a kind of shoe that is the tock tock tick tock like tap dancing there is something in tap dancing there's something in walking with that sharp hammering sound it's almost like a, a woman who is expressing her masculinity she's expressing her dominance it's hey you're going to hear me before i'm even in the room you're going to know when i'm coming you're going to know when i'm here and you're going to know when i leave me pay me attention now high heels also have this thing of they change the shape of the leg and there are certain fashion things and certain situations and certain 
moments where high heels are worn. It's usually a formal occasion. But there are women's shoes that are both high heels and, and not that, that tap loud. I mean, not all high heels are loud, I don't think. But there's something there. And just like Conor McGregor, who might come out with a strut and then get hit, the woman might be overcompensating for her confidence. Don't think that because she's wearing loud shoes that that expression of, hey, I am confident, is real. Not every woman is like that. Not every woman carries that. It might be that that woman is wearing that because that's her hope. That's what she, her, her idea of fitting in is. Trying to please the crowd, trying to get the job, trying to impress the boss. And it's a damn shame that we live in a society where women have to feel like that. And even more generally, women feel very upset and very pressured by how they have to dress, how they have to look, how they have to present themselves. So in the case of a woman that's walking very loudly, don't simply put up your nose so quickly and say, oh, she's so attention-seeking. And I really feel women shouldn't have to do that. Women should feel perfectly comfortable to wear as they like what they want. They shouldn't have this nagging thing about, oh, I'm going to go out with these certain people in these certain situations, so there's a range of certain things that I can or cannot wear, and I'm going to go through this long, complicated process to work out if it works or not so I can be comfortable. And maybe there's something in that which is the, the woman enjoys that. I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on the women. I'll get myself into trouble. But this is just an idea. This is just the learning to walk. When a woman... When a woman learns to walk, when a woman has a strut, that's very different to when a man has a strut. The sex walk, the, the appeal walk, the sex appeal, look at me, showing off walk, that's very different for women than it is for men. And we see this most, probably most extremely in the cat walk. Have you seen these fashion shows? Have you seen this culture of showing off women's bodies? And they have these absolutely fantastic outfits. They are glorious. And they're in these huge events with lights and cameras and flashing photography and this huge crowd and all this attention, all this focus is on all this pent-up hype is surrounding the catwalk. And I don't say this as a negative thing. Really, it can be seen as a glorious celebration of femininity celebrating the beauty of a woman, the magnificence of the female body. And it really is extraordinary. And there's something in the catwalk. Why is it called the catwalk? Do cats actually walk like that? I think they do. I think there's something in a cat which is like they're walking narrow stance. Is that what it is? As in one paw goes forward, and then the next paw goes in front of that, like they're walking along a tightrope. Whereas with humans, we walk more parallel, not, not perfectly parallel. Let, let's, say we have, let's say we have like a tightrope walk or a single line. The cat with its four legs would walk along that single line. And then the other extreme of that is the parallel lines, which is like train tracks. So a human walking parallel would have one foot on each rail of the train tracks and that would be parallel or single and then actually in actual fact the human is somewhere between parallel and the catwalk i believe so why is it that 
the catwalk is used in these fashion shows. Is there something in a cat which is embodying it, it's in that these women embody the cat as a primal expression because the cat fits that showing off that coolness become a cat do women become cats when they do the catwalk if you ask these supermodels these massive gorgeous incredible women what's your spirit animal would they say a cat? How many of them would say a cat? It would make sense that they're all cats. And of course, there's even, like, what is this? There's a dance group called the Pussycat Dolls, I believe. And there's a mu musical called, called Cats. So the archetype of the cat as a primal animal or a spirit animal that you can embody that's really something to learn. That's really like the, the best way to embody a cat is to walk like a cat. That's really what it comes back to. Now, all animals have their own walk. Can you walk like a gorilla? This is, an, this is a whole other area. We can imprint. So here what we're doing, we're overlaying our animal archetypes onto walking. So this is, is going to multiply your learning to walk matrix. And you can simply say, you, you do it like this. You say, walk like a, name the animal. Walk like a cat. Walk like a gorilla. Walk like an elephant. Walk like a mouse. Walk like a mongoose. Walk like an emu. Walk like an ostrich. Walk like a walrus. Walk like a lion. Walk like a snake. Snakes don't walk. How can I walk like a snake? Walk like a monkey. Walk like a meerkat. Walk like a fox. Walk like a lone wolf. Walk like a rabbit. Walk like a pig. Walk like a bird. Walk like an ant. Walk like a spider. And I'm sure you can go on with more and more. You can think of your own. And simply by walking like these things, you embody something from them. Isn't that funny? Isn't it so simple how these things can open up? By putting, two, by putting two simple things together, you change your whole experience. And to, tr to try these, to test these, you do it. You simply do it. And it would only take five or ten minutes for you to feel that difference, for your walk to change. Now, is there something in sports? Have you ever seen these marathon walkers walk? I was friends with an Olympian walker. And he was in the 2008 Beijing Olympics for walking. And it was this funny thing where we'd sit around and I think this one time someone said, Oh, show us the walk. Show us how you walk. Because how he walks around the house or around wherever we were hanging out was not the same as his official Olympic walk. There was a real technique to it. And it looked really quite funny. It was this, there's this hip movement because they're always trying to get the exact efficiency out of the, the heel to toe, the heel to foot without getting a, without being disqualified without getting a foul. And it looked really funny when he showed us all. He said, wow, that's really different. That's how you walk in the Olympics? That's very strange. I won't mention who he is. I believe he's since retired. Aussie guy, obviously. 
But there's also something about the the way the way I remember Jack DeJanet saying this. He's a jazz drummer, and he was actually, funnily enough, he was talking about boxing, and he was talking about warm ups, and he said the the boxer who's warmed up has a certain walk. And maybe I'm making this up. Maybe it's not Jack DeJanet. And maybe I'm just adding words to him. I don't know. It doesn't matter too much about that. Let's not get into detailed references. But you can see, think of this from all sports. Think of this as there's a, there's a critical moment right before the performance for all sports, whether it's swimming or football or any team sports or any sort of water sports or any individual sort of sports there's a there's a walk which the sports star has right before there's a way that they're walking right before their performance the swimmers have to walk out to their platforms the football team has to walk out onto the full onto the field The shooter or the archery or the dart thrower has to walk out onto wherever it is that they're performing. And in that, in that moment, you can see, you should be able to see how much confidence they have, how prepared they are. And you can see that they're not walking like just some, they're not scuffing their feet. They haven't got their tail between their legs. And they're not, they're not strutting either. Well, maybe in the case of Conor McGregor, he is strutting. <laughs> normally, normally sports stars don't have a boyish strut because they're too mature for that. They're too aware of themselves in that moment for the strut. And I'd like to do a comparison. I'd like to see that. The teams that lost versus the teams that won. Now, in some football fields, some football games, what they have is this, they put up this big banner and the team is meant to break through it. They smash into it and they break through and they run. They're actually not walking, they're running. And that sort of hyped up, yeah, yeah, here we come, look at us, that sort of breakthrough moment is there to build up the energy for the team. The reason they do that ritual is so that they can do that, so that they can have a performance which is it, it, it's built up for a peak performance. It's a ritual there to support their performance, to optimize their ability. And even just walking out onto the field if it's baseball or cricket or tennis, there's something in it. So when we talk about meditation and becoming more aware of your experience of reality, or building consciousness, awareness, through walking, there's really, two, there's really two basic techniques that you can use. One is counting your steps, which is quite simply you count from 1 to 10, and then you count again from 1 to 10. And sometimes it's not even from 1 to 10. You can just do left, right. It's 1, 2. One, two, that's enough. Or you can count to a hundred, depending on how long your meditation retreat is. And that's one simple, very simple technique, counting your steps. And the other one, the second of the two main ones I'd like to share with you today, is very simple and yet very powerful. And this is the, this is the one this is the one thing, this is the one golden technique for learning to walk 
out of all the techniques that you can come across and all the different ins and outs and things to be aware of, this this is the one I recommend the most. And it's the most powerful and yet the most simple. And it's this. You walk slightly slower. And in that one technique is the secret to awareness, the secret to meditation, and the secret to mastering your body. If you could just slow down, then you could build awareness. Now there is an infinity of subtlety between the pace that you walk now and standing still. Consider this. You walk at a certain pace, and there's a difference between that and not moving at all, or standing still. And you can always have a more detailed increment in the spectrum of different speeds between those two points. And the trick is, you carry around this thing in your head that you walk slower. And whenever you'll forget, of course you'll forget, throughout your day, whenever you remember, and this is why you need, you need at least some meditation practice for this. You need at least some awareness. It's not really an entry-level technique. It's more of an intermediate technique. So you need to remind yourself you need to have the ability to remind yourself each moment, each time throughout the day. You just simply say, walk slightly slower. Now, it doesn't mean walk in slow motion. It doesn't mean slow right down. And that therein is the trick to just go a little bit slower, just a hair. Just find that fine line, that little detail, which is slightly slower. And it's slow enough, just slow enough, not that people would stop and say, wow, that man is really looking very slow. Did someone point the remote control at him and press slow motion button? Something like that. No, it's not like that. You just go slightly slower. And it's funny, when you meet someone or you go for a walk with someone, and this happens when you, when you get into a relationship, you'll notice this. When you first meet someone, you first meet that girlfriend or that boyfriend, You'll set off and you'll both have a totally different pace. <laughs> and of course, in couples which have been together for some time, they're perfectly synchronized. Now they've centered themselves, they've joined, they've merged, and they walk hip to hip, and their pace is exactly the same. And it's perfectly comfortable for them. And you could, you could literally give them a three-legged race. You could tie their inside legs together. You could tie them together and it wouldn't make a difference. They're always the winner. The, the winners of the three-legged race. Have you seen these? Did you have these as a kid? Sort of like a, the, the potato sack race, but you have a three-legged race. You know what that is, right? Two people stand together and they tie their legs together. And off you go. And of course... When you're a kid and you're trying this, you think, no, no, you go first. No, now, okay, now left, no, right. No, wait, if we don't say left and right, no, it won't work because that's your left and that's my right and then that's inside, outside, and all. Oh, here we go. And the couple that wins, the pair of kids that win are the ones that can work together, the ones that can listen to each other and watch each other. And the same thing happens with couples. When you synchronize with your partner, and you walk with your arm around each other, and your bodies are in tune, then if you're being intimate with your partner correctly and deeply, then you'll naturally tune to each other. You'll naturally be centered. So if you're in a long-term relationship, take this as a test to see how close you are. Take this as a test to see if your bodies are still synchronized. And if they're not, well, <laughs> I can show you some centering exercises and some grounding exercises and some 
dissolving exercises and <laughs> some tantra exercises to get that back on track. But when you first meet that partner, or maybe you're just walking with friends, it doesn't have to be boyfriend or girlfriend. Now, I'm someone who sticks to my guns. and I, I usually walk very slow at certain times. Well, I have a variety. I'm aware enough of this to have a variety. But most often when I'm walking with someone, I'm walking much slower. And I simply say to them, look, I'm going to take a long time. I walk slow. That's just how I am. So experiment with that. It's as simple as walk slower. And there's also, just like you walk slightly slower than your normal pace, there's also a, there's a, there's an insight which is between stopped and slow. So if you dedicate some time specifically for this, the good thing about walking slower is it actually doesn't take you extra time. You actually build an efficiency. When you're walking slower, just like the man who was doing this massive meditation retreat and he spent 26 days and ended up having to take an hour and a half to, do, to have lunch so he wouldn't forget his spoon, the same principle applies here for just being slower. You get a smaller taste of that just by going slower, which is when you slow your walking, everything slows down. And you might think, well, I'm a busy person. I need to work hard. And that kind of walk, that busy person walk, that's a kind of walk. That's a, I'm here to, to get things done walk. That's not like a strut. That's like a, let's get on with it. And there is something in hard work. I don't want to discourage that. I'm not here to take away people's abilities to work hard. But... It might be, let me suggest to you, allow me to suggest that there's an efficiency there. Because when you slow down, you don't forget the spoon. You don't walk back and forth. There's a hyper, there's a sort of distracted, unscented, like uh, uh, walking this way. Oh, I forgot this. Then walk back that way. Oh, I forgot that. And then walk back this way. And oh, I forgot this. And oh, now I need to go over there. But oh, halfway there, you've realized you forgot this. That kind of situation, that buzzing, uh, uh, I don't know where I'm going. There is a very big efficiency in energy that can be solved by simply slowing down. And you see this at certain meditation retreats or meditation courses or meditation processes. They have this, there's the meditator's walk. Now, when you're doing a, a course for meditation, you're spending 10, 12 hours a day meditating and the bell goes off for lunch. Well, there you have all the time in the world to walk from the meditation hall down to the cafeteria down to the kitchen and so you take your time you naturally walk you want to enjoy the walk there's no rush there's plenty of food we're all going to get our food it's all going to happen in due time there's no need to rush and it's in those moments where that you're actually building your experience of walking and it's so subtle Almost like, it's almost like breathing because you're always breathing. So it would make sense to make that experience a rich experience. If you could improve your breathing, you would improve so much of your life because you're always, you're always breathing. Just in the same principle, if you could improve your walking, you would improve so much of your life because you're always walking. You're always having to step where you're going. And there are as many insights into learning to walk and as many things to watch as there are in breathing or as in more specifically anapana technique. So you've got to watch that the, the heel does go first. And you watch that your foot rolls. It's a rolling sensation. 
and you can become sensitized to the pressure, the push of the ground on the skin of your feet. And also the roundness of your joints moving in your ankle, in your knee, and in your hip. Do you realize that when you walk, your knee, there's a circle there. There's a roundness to what happens in the knee joint. And how smooth that is, is something that you can be aware of experientially. And now to test this, you can work on just that. Just take a few steps walking and say, I'm going to walk as if my knees are sort of stuck to a circle that's spinning around and around. And you notice how having your attention there in your knees and having that flow happens changes your walking. And you can also stretch the length of your steps because you can walk slower, but that doesn't rule out this difference between a longer step or a shorter step. You see what it's like to take slightly shorter steps? Just take a few steps and, and you say, how far am I stretching? Is it too far this way, that way? And take smaller steps and then take longer steps. So you can walk very slow, but take very big steps. And the list goes on and on. The, the, the amount of things you can experiment with. There's more, there's more experientially than I could ever say. And there's more that you can find than I've ever found. Or either of us have ever found. There's always more to find in this. And they do link up to ex existential insights. There are metaphorical places you can get. If you can walk in a straight line, then you can live in a straight line. If you can walk, how about this one for you? If you can walk from one point to another point without being distracted, then you can live your life without being distracted. And you can say, well, okay, let's test this. I'll walk, from my, I'll walk from my bedroom to the bathroom. And if you can do that, that's one point A to point B without being distracted. But then you can say, well, I'll go from the bathroom, from the bedroom to the bathroom, back to the bedroom. Okay, and then where? To the kitchen? And then back to your room. Now we've got A, B, A, C, A. And we can call that one journey. We can call that one leg constructed by s smaller legs of the, of the journey. And we can string that into a day and say, well, how would you walk to each place that you go as small as from the bedroom to the bathroom for the entire day without being distracted. And just exactly what is your intention for going to these places? How clear must you be for where you are going to walk next? For that to count as, this was my intention to walk there. And there's a lot to learn about intention there. There's so much to learn about intention that it applies, it will start to apply to your whole life. What direction am I going in life? You know that metaphor? That is a metaphor. It's used so much it thinks it's real. You think it's real. I've, I've definitely fallen for it. Well, what direction are you walking? If you could know that, then that would be deep enough for you to learn what direction you're going in life. Have you got a lot of distractions? Do you go down a lot of dead ends? Do you have to track back a lot and go back to where you've already been? Do you have to go to the same place over and over again? Are you tired of going to the same place? Are you in a hurry to get away from where you are, but yet somehow you're always there? 
Are you on a long journey? And you know that there's a long way to go. So this kind of metaphorical talk comes from this difference between a very simple down-to-earth action, such as walking, and its connection to the existential, the large, the big picture. Which is why if you can learn to walk, well then you can learn to live. And if you can walk like a cat, then you can be a supermodel. And if you can walk with a strut, you can be a boxer. And if you can walk like a monk, you can be a meditator. <laughs> well, I think that covers about all. I mean, I haven't I haven't presented a whole bunch of different techniques like we did in learning to breathe. The the, the two ones is counting steps and slowing your steps, slowing your walk. And just in those two, there's enough to keep you busy for some years. There's enough to learn in those. So I'm not going to overload you with a whole bunch of elaborate countings and timings and tempos and spaces and things like that. So enjoy and let me know how you go with it. Let me know if you know how to walk and notice what type of different walks there are when you see them in other people. How many walks do you have? Do you have different walks? Do you have different paces for different times of day or different situations? Do you notice when that certain person comes along that your that your walk changes? When you know you're being watched? You know the caterpillar? You know this caterpillar story that, that was really good at dancing? No, not the caterpillar, the centipede. The centipede is this brilliant dancer. And every night he just tears the roof off the club with its amazing dance of all its feet. And the caterpillar was jealous of the centipede. So the caterpillar, all, they, all he had to do was say, how do you dance like that? Is it the left foot, then the right, or the right, then the left? And then, of course, then the centipede starts to think and thinks, oh, maybe it's the left, mate. No, wait, is it the right or the left? I don't know. And then the, cat, the centipede gets into tangles, and he can't perform anymore because he's too much of a in his mind. <laughs> well, that's the metaphor. That's just one of, that's just like a cute story that comes to mind. So slow down, count your walks, count your steps. And as always, we'll finish with a few minutes of silence. So just close your eyes and sit quietly for a few moments. And relax and allow the comments that you've heard here to percolate. And just be quiet. And sit with how things are. Breathe softly. And don't be in a rush to be off to the next thing. And that's all I have to say for now. <laughs>